Hello, guys, and welcome to the Rebound Talks podcast, where we're going to help you find the best tools, tips, and techniques needed to overcome any adversity. Today, we're going to be talking about how to find that purpose or what the Japanese call ikigai in your life, mindfulness, the dangers of AI, and much more. We're going to be speaking with Ken Mogi who's a neuroscientist, best-selling author, and broadcaster based out of Tokyo, Japan. He's a senior researcher at Sony Computer Science Laboratories and a professor of the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Ken has written over 100, yes, 100 folks, books on popular science, essay, criticism, and self-help. In 2012, he gave Japan's first TED Talk ever. So I hope you enjoy and stay tuned. Hello, Ken. It's really great to have you here. You're actually our first Japanese speaker on the show. Oh, so right. thank you for coming on. Yeah. I hope I won't be the last one, you know. <laughs> I, I hope too. I hope so too. Okay. Yeah. I would love to dive deeply into your latest book, Awakening Your Ikigai. And for those people that don't know, what is Ikigai, basically? Uh, ikigai is a Japanese word for the purpose of your life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it, can be, it can be something really small, like taking your dog for a walk in the morning or taking a cup of coffee or, or you know. This, so so fr from these really small things to your life's ultimate goal, like in my case, I, I like to understand how consciousness arises from the brain that's a long shot but you know <laughs> that's my probably utmost ikigai but you know you so ikigai is a spectrum of things that makes you carry on with your daily chores and it's a really typical japanese concept and many japanese knows uh it it's meaning intuitively I love how you say it's the reason to wake up in the morning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really wonderful term. Uh, you know, Antonio, do you find it ever difficult to wake up in the morning? Yes, I do. You Indeed. do? Oh, yeah. you need some ikigai then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for... you know, I personally, I never find it difficult to get up in the morning because I have tons of things to do. And, you know, as, as, as soon as I get up in the morning, I... I'm too excited to, you know, I'm mm -hmm. really, I jump out of my bed and, you know, start yep. doing things. So. How everybody should do. But for people like me that snooze the alarm like five, six times, how can they find that ikigai in their life? Are the five pillars that you mentioned yeah. the way or what do you recommend? Uh, one of the five pillars of ikigai is starting small. So I suggest that you start small, like, you no, know, I think nowadays everybody has his or her smartphone, you know, mm -hmm. inside. So the moment I get up, I check the news. Nowadays, there's some crazy news in the world, right? And mm -hmm. like President Trump tweeted something again and so on. And, you know, <laughs> that, you know, if you look at these news, that would release dopamine in your brain. Now, dopamine is some a substance that calls for novelty. So if there's something novel in your life that makes your brain uh, start kicking right away. So I suggest uh, probably you start by looking at your smartphone, but I, I suspect that is actually what people are doing anyway. <laughs> no? Yeah, I think so. But they could also be looking at negative things, negative news. Would that still have the same effect? Uh, from brain neuroscientific point of view, uh, it's the same thing actually. Uh, hmm. You know, any news, uh, as far as they are a novel news, mm -hmm. uh, you can use it to stimulate your brain. And actually, uh, you know, uh, for example, in Japan, we had a really terrible earthquake and tsunami in 2011. Uh, the U.S. had this, uh, you know, twin tower attack in 2001. These news are terrible, but it also it uh, stimulates your brain from deep within, and you actually become really alert and start to live at your full speed. So hmm. these are really extreme cases, but uh, it's a fact that any news is actually good to stimulate your brain. 
So we should definitely start with a little bit of dopamine in our morning. So it gives us a kick to start the day. Definitely. Um, it can, it should be something novel. Uh, another technique that I often recommend to people is to you know, get some sunshine. I mean, you know, because in the brain, there are some receptors that get activated when you have light coming into your brain. So, you know, mm -hmm. what I do is, uh, you know, in, in Japan, I don't know about Spain, but in Japan, we have a lot of convenience stores. You know, Japanese convenience stores are really, really um, heavenly. I mean, you can get <laughs> anything there. You know, and you know, so I, what I do is when I get up, I go to a convenience store, just a few minutes walk away. And mm -hmm. during my walk there, I get all this sunshine into my brain so that I have a fully functional conscious brain. Yeah. Do you have, that, oh, I don't know about your location, but if you have any I, place you can walk to in the morning, I personally, as soon as I wake up, I love to start with meditation. It oh. allows me to, because I suffer, I used to suffer from a lot of anxiety. So this calms me down and lets me, my problem is not getting kicked up. It's actually slowing down. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Because, you know, uh, it, that's interesting because you can actually uh, tear a made Ikigai for yourself because every person's brain is different. So I happen to be a person who um, I have a more or less stable mindset. I, I don't get, you know, so emotionally disturbed. So I mm -hmm. can take a lot of, uh, you know, stimulus at the, mm -hmm. at the beginning of my day. But some people, you know, some some of my best friends, they are really, you know, uh, sensitive to things. So uh, for these people, I would say I suggest that they start the day with some very mild, calming, uh, you know, way of getting up your brain for the day, and that's just like in your case. And these are really fine people, uh, like like you. So, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, it is very important to fine tune your ikigai protocol in the morning, based on your brain type. I completely agree. And when we're talking about starting small as the first pillar. Yeah. I'm noticing a lot of people that think that overnight success is something that's possible, especially now with social media, seeing all these people po um, showing off everything that they have. But what they don't know, what people don't realize is that one, a lot of those people don't actually have those things. And two, they don't see the grind behind all the show. They might have been working for years to then achieve that, but we don't see that in social media. So in a, in a culture that's obsessed with uh, overnight successes, how can we teach them to start small? Oh, that's, I think, a wonderful question. Uh, maybe you, you don't know, but uh, there was this uh, Japanese comedian uh, who really made a break with this character, Pikotaro. Uh, He's a guy who is dressed in a really crazy attire and uh, says, pen, pineapple, <laughs> apple pen. And this <laughs> ah, see that, see that. <laughs> you know that, Pikotaro? Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and Justin Bieber picked it up and it made, it was a world sensation. But, uh, you know, I had, as, you know, as a neuroscientist, I have, you know, I, I also uh, work as a broadcaster in Japan. So I interviewed Pikotaro uh, at some time. And what he said was really amazing. You know, he actually, you, people might think that the Picotaro made his name overnight, just like mm -hmm. you described. But actually, he was much, very much into electronic music for many, many years. And he studied many effectors. And I don't know the details, but, you know, there were some effectors that electric musicians uh, used for many years. And what he did with that Picotaro you know, YouTube video was something really, really professional. Some many people don't notice it, but it was the result of many years of sophisticated work and you know, but he put it in that very simple form, which can be understood by a two year old. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, as you said, I think it is the case that if somebody has is appears to make have made a overnight success, 
that is only the appearance of it. You know, behind the scenes, they have been doing all these chores and you know, studying small from small things and doing that, doing this, and you know, and you only see the tip of the iceberg. We only see the tip of the iceberg, and people should actually strive, as you say in your book, to do something that they're passionate about, no matter the monetary outcome. Yeah, uh, that's uh, my strong belief. You know, um, you know this uh, concept uh, popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, 10,000 hours rule. You know, if you work on it uh, on something for 10,000 hours, that if you work for three hours, I think that's about 10 years. You know, if you work on something that wrong, then you can become an expert. And that is very much in line with what the Japanese people have traditionally uh, held as values related to Ikigai. Because, you know, uh, for example, many craftsmen in Japan, uh, they work for many, many hours every day to achieve a state of, you know, masterpiece. And you cannot do that overnight. So that is embedded in a cultural uh, mindset uh, as a common knowledge. And that is something I think uh, is really uh, particular about Japanese uh, society. We don't believe in overnight success so much, you know. And we definitely have to learn from that, have to implement this. And you're talking about craftsmen and something that I noticed in your book was the starred bowls and how important they are in your culture, how much they're worth. It was just incredible to me to know that something like that exists. Start? <laughs> the starred bowls, the, the bowls that have uh, the stars in them. Starred bowls. Or oh, maybe you. Uh, there's a Spanish translation, is it? Starred bowls. It's, a, it's an English one. The bowls that, that oh, there's yeah, only yeah. three. <laughs> Aaron. Yeah, yeah, that is an extraordinary story. You know, I mean, uh, it was originally Chinese, and nobody knows how to make these bowls. And it's really beautiful. Uh, if you have a chance to take a look at it, it's wow. There are only three, as you said, there are only three remaining bowls with this starry figure. And the starry figure, starry pattern inside, is not artificial. Right? They, it's natural. Something that happens when you put them in fire. And, you know, um, some process goes on. And not, you know, nobody knows how, but these patterns appear. And some craftsmen actually have tried over many years to kind of reproduce that exact pattern, but nobody has really successes, succeeded. So it's, uh, if you like, the holy grail of, you know, ball making. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, so, yeah, we can't have that kind of obsession. Uh, it, it's just a ball. <laughs> ball. But some people go really crazy about it. You, you, maybe you know this Japanese word, kodawari. Kodawari is when somebody has a really high expectation of quality and uh, he or she would strive to achieve it without you know, necessarily making a lot of money on the way. But that's in Japanese culture too, this wonderful kodawari spirit. And yeah, it's a, it's a strange mindset, but uh, it's there, you know. And I think there's something very important to learn from this kodawari that is re releasing oneself, which I think is the second pillar. And I think this is one of the most important things that people should strive to do in their lives. That's why I personally have uh, started this meditation practice. I've been doing it for three years because I feel that ego is definitely the enemy. And as you mentioned, when we're kids, we don't seem to have this problem of releasing ourselves. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects of Ikiga is that you don't care about uh, how people, uh, you know, evaluate you. You, you so much. I mean, you know, now it's we are living in this uh, era of social media, and everybody is keen on having a lot of followers and so on. But if you do that too much, uh, 
you cannot really be released from yourself. And you know, it's the art of the unconscious. You know, if you look back on Japanese history, uh, there have been always this emphasis on, you know, to be released from your uh, pride, your preoccupations, your, you know, jealousy, all these emotions that can arise from social interactions. So, you know, in Japan, I think the most respected people are those who have devoted their, their lives to something bigger than themselves. You know, you know in Japan, uh, egomaniac people are not so highly regarded. I mean, the most highly regarded people are those people who do not care about themselves so much. Do you have any response to that in Europe? I mean, you know, do you have that card? I, I, I think that this is definitely something that is encouraged. And now in the younger generation, uh -huh. we're seeing a lot of interest in stoicism and in meditation, the mindfulness movement. So I feel that this is something that's taking off here too, definitely. I, that's interesting. Yeah, um, because, you know, uh, when I visited uh, Spain, uh, for example, I, I went to uh, Barcelona and Madrid and all these great works, artworks, you know, I, I think these masters were released from themselves. Otherwise, they cannot paint, you know, uh, great paintings like Velázquez. I, I don't know how to pronounce it in Spanish. Velázquez? Velázquez? Velázquez. Velázquez. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the greatest, I mean. Uh, that, so I, I don't think, you know, these great painters, when they paint, actually, you know, this, uh, you know, idea of flow uh, originated from observing painters. When they paint, they forget about themselves and they just focus on the work. So, you know, I, I think uh, Velasquez, when he painted these really mu wonderful masterpieces, I think he was released from himself and he was just absorbed in the painting that he was making and so i think it's actually a universal phenomenon that in japan we just have this word ikigai as an umbrella term to describe this set of mindset and you know that's that's why i think it's wonderful to have this conversation because it's something that we have in common but uh it's something that the japanese happen to have uh developed uh, some sophisticated you know way to approach for so yeah, definitely. And this state of flow, I would love for you to describe it for the people that don't know. And I personally think that tying yourself to something higher than yourself is what all the great achievers have done, because they're the only ones that once achieving something, they didn't let the ego take over because they knew that they had something greater than themselves to strive for. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, uh, neuroscience has, it's just starting to understand what is happening in your brain uh, when that happens. And one thing is certain that, you know, uh, when you are really focused on something, there is this minimum uh, set of activities in the brain going on uh, in many circuits. So it's not that your brain is activated at a maximum level. It's the opposite. It's a minimalist approach to focusing on something. So, so presumably, uh, focusing on something and being connected to something bigger than you uh, involves the deactivation rather than activation of many brain circuits. So I think that is something that has been intuitively taught in the tradition of Zen Buddhism because. I will tell you a very funny story. You know, I have a really great friend uh, who was trained for more than ten years as a Zen Buddhist. You, do you know what happens when you enter a temple? The first day, you know, all this merit system goes away. So, so in the real world, if you do something good, you uh, you have some brownie points. You you get good scores <laughs> and. People think highly of you. But once in the Zen temple, uh, whatever you do, if you do your chores, if you do your meditation, you know, it 
you nobody takes notice of it. I mean, there's no merit system, point system. So uh, he said that that was the greatest shock that he had entering a Zen temple. So that way you actually st stripped of your concern for yourself. I mean, you know, because in the real world, like we are doing, we are all concerned about, you know, credits and merits and, you know, points and, you know, all these things, rewards and, but once in the Zen temple, all these things do not matter anymore. So that's an, that's an extreme approach to what we are discussing now. But the tradition is there. And, you know, it's really interesting to, you know, uh, co consider uh, the intuitive understanding of the human brain that these great uh, Zen Buddhists had over the years, you know. It's definitely very interesting. And I feel like three of the five pillars that you talk about, releasing oneself, being in the here and now, and the joy of small things can be achieved through being mindful, through cultivating practices taught by Zen Buddhists. Yeah, that's uh, what I feel. I think, yeah, I think so. Mindfulness is probably one of the greatest ideas that have come up uh, in the last couple of decades, I think. And, you know, uh, it is very much related to the science of consciousness. And, you know, it's, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, in, in Buddhism, they say that there are 52 stages of enlightenment, you know, and only Buddha achieved the highest uh, stage, they say. And one uh, Buddhist priest uh, in he, famous in Japanese history, he was asked by one of his disciples, what stage did, ha, has, he, has the master achieved? And he said only 11th, 11th stage. So, you know, there's this idea that uh, in Zen Buddhism, you have this uh, stairs of metacognition. Uh, and if you climb up the stairs, you become more aware of yourself and of your environment. So you have higher stages of mindfulness. And I think uh, Buddha had, you know, theoretically had the highest stage of uh, mindfulness so that he realized all these things that are happening in the world. You know, so this, I think, is a very nice idea because it is something different from the idea of uh, IQ, for example, general intelligence. You know, uh, people are so obsessed with uh, how, who is clever and who is intelligent, but uh, mindfulness is something totally different. You know, it asks you how well you are taking into your mind the feeling of other people, feeling of yourself, and feeling of what is happening in society at large. So I think that's a really wonderful concept. Yes, I, I think it's a wonderful concept too. And as you said, I definitely think there's other stages of mindfulness or other stages of enlightenment. As a neuroscientist yourself, I personally love that you chose this career path because I feel that the future of science is going to be in the internal rather than the external. That there's a lot to learn from consciousness, from diving deeply inside yourself than doing something external per se as IQ, just studying people with high IQ. We should study people that have been able to reach this high states of mindfulness, as you say. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I think there's a great danger because artificial intelligence research is advancing so much. Uh, you know, some people think that we can probably, you know, discard humanity, you know, totally. I mean, some people are talking about mind uploading. I mean, we can probably transfer all our information to a computer and all this stuff, you know, and some people are obsessed with this idea of transhumanism or posthumanism, uh, discussing what would come after the human being. But uh, for me, that kind of attitude is really ridiculous because, you know, and intellectually not 
so honest because as you say we have not really understood ourselves you know so if you can use artificial intelligence as a mirror to understand ourselves that would be great but you know artificial intelligence ai just represents a tiny tiny part of our existence as of our spirituality so if uh, people who are really enthusiastic about mind uploading and whole brain emulation and all these ideas uh, if they think that uh, you know we can replace human beings with systems that are behaving intelligently, that is the, probably the biggest mistake that humans would make in the whole history of humanity. So nobody has really understood the whole spectrum of our mind, and there are so many things to explore, and we are just on the verge of a new era of. Uh, you know, spirituality. I'm not saying this as a kind of a, you know, a new age, you know, type of thinking. I'm just describing mm -hmm. it as a scientific fact, scientific fact to say that there's all this richness of human experience that we haven't understood yet. So, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree because we are investigating AI as a sort of competition to ourselves instead mm -hmm. of instead of using it to helping us know ourselves better, which we both know is very important for happiness and it's very important for cultivating Ikigai too. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I know this podcast uh, you, you have created with your youthful uh, zeal, your enthusiasm. You know, and <laughs> that's very interesting because, you know, uh, you know what, sometimes I think, you know, for example, the, in the game of Go or Shogi or Chess, uh, AI have surpassed uh, humans already, but I am already always asking if you know the same would be true for uh, works of art or music. You know, even if um, AI uh, creates some music, uh, would that mean anything? I mean, you know, I know many artists who dedicate their life uh, to achieve something. You know, I, I guess this uh, podcast is well, your work of art. You know, uh, but you know, you have put your all your passion and enthusiasm to it. But you know, if the same thing is done by an AI, I, I don't, I don't personally think that there is some equivalent uh, spirituality or joy of the mind in it. So, I, I, I know people talk a lot about uh, you know AI surpassing humans in general knowledge quiz or chess or shogi or go or self-driving cars but uh i don't think that is actually what is essentially human uh what is essentially human is represented by the great uh novel don quixote for example <laughs> you know, I, I i used i used to be a physics major I, I got my phd in physics so albert einstein was my hero and you know albert einstein always read don quixote when he was sick <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> Maybe he said, do, do, do you have any intuition? Why do you think Albert Einstein would read Don Quixote for, you know, when he is I, sick? <laughs> I, I personally not, don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea why he would do that. But, you know, it's, it's, what do you think? I, don't, I mean, maybe there's some, there was something, there was some dissonance with this, you know, man who pursued his romantic goal despite you know, many difficulties. Maybe he was identifying with Don Quixote. I, I don't know. But this kind of thing, intentionality and sense of purpose is totally missing uh, in uh, AI systems. And by the way, so I, I, all these things actually have a lot to do with Ikigai, actually. Uh, if you, I mean, you know, maybe people are not so familiar. Maybe you're familiar with this uh, Captain Tsubasa manga. Captain no, I, oh, Sebastian. Maybe, yeah, it's supposed to be a football manga. I, I think so, but I'm not sure. I'm well, not anyway, sure. Yeah, Could you describe yeah, it? We have. Well, it's uh, about this boy who grows up in, in pursuing his dream of being a great uh, football player, soccer player, and achieves it. I, I heard. I heard that it has influenced many uh, kids in Europe to, you know, and it, in Korea. Is that the one 
where in reality he was in a coma without legs or no? Uh, Doesn't it end like that? In some part of it, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, okay. I, I in some part of it, by the way. But uh, what I was trying to say was, you know, in Japan we have really great uh, genre of manga dealing with sportsmen trying to achieve his or her great goal. And it's almost like a samurai warrior trying to perfect his sword uh, mastery and so on. So, so in Japan, we have this culture almost like Don Quixote, where you know uh, boys and girls would pursue their dreams no matter what. And that, so we Japanese uh, know the concept of Ikigai from our earliest ages because we read this manga dealing with sports, um, like baseball, football, karate, judo. Uh, so I, I, I think there's this culture of lifelong purposes uh, in the popular media to even uh, in Japan. So that, That's great. And I think it should be like that everywhere. Everybody should strive to know and to pursue their ikigai or their higher purpose. But for the people that haven't found it yet, what can they do? Uh, you know, most often when they rem remember when how they were like in when they were really small, like you know, when they were really small kids, uh, most of the time they used to have actually something that gave them pleasure. For example, one of my friends who is a producer of uh, TV programs and so on. He said that he used to like uh, surprising people. Uh, you know, uh, when somebody has a birthday, he would prepare something really intricate and present it, and they were surprised. And <laughs> he, he, he speaks that probably that was his inspiration for his lifelong career. So I think everybody has something that they had pleasure in. Uh, well, how about you, Antonio? What, what gave you pleasure when you were young? I personally think I've always loved helping other people. I've Ooh. got a lot of pleasure from helping other people, especially solve specific problems. I That's what... Really? Yes. So that, that, this is your dream job, actually. <laughs> yes, basically. Oh, well, that's wonderful. I'm trying... I'm trying to follow my ikigai with this. Wow, that's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, so I, yeah. I, th this should be it for you, I think, you know, if. I think so too. <laughs> that, that's great. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I know, you know, um, you know talking about, but I, I hope you will continue this for, you know, many years. Uh, Evolving, of course. Yeah, I, I just remember the, you know, this singer, American singer, Billie Eilish. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she was in this car, car pool karaoke program, and you know, this comedian visited uh, Billie Eilish's uh, home, and you know, where he made all, she made all her music as a teenager, and on the entrance to the room, they had this uh, motto. A uh, ten thousand hours, you know, written. So, oh, Billie Eilish was following this ten thousand hours rule. Uh, you know, you can see it on YouTube, and it's so wonderful. So now she's a superstar. But uh, before that, she had all these days of, you know, working on music, and you know. So, so I, I think if you do it uh, for long enough, I, I think you can arrive uh, someday. Definitely. So you're saying that Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell's rule of 10,000 hours in a scientific perspective also makes a lot of sense that dedicating yourself to something, 10,000 hours, you will become a master. I, I hope so. I, I think so. Because, you know, and because, you know, uh, based on our knowledge on neuroplasticity, uh, you know, when you do something, you learn and your wire, uh, neural circuits are wired in that way. And you, it's actually something that does not saturate so easily. I mean, if you 
reach a stage, you can build on that, and it's like climbing stairs. So as you know, longer you work, higher you can go. You know, I, there was this really funny episode in for uh, uh, Germany. I think uh, a man was really bad at arithmetic. You know, he can he could not calculate at all. But he one day he all of a sudden he decides to train himself, and he does it uh, five hours, ten hours every day, doing arithmetic in his mind. And believe it or not, now he is a professional calculator, appearing in <laughs> music halls and so on. And when neuroscientists examined his brain, they were astonished to find that he was using actually brain circuits not typically used for calculating, for calculation. So he was using his whole brain to do this calculation now uh, for which um, he's now a uh, prof professional. So you, so you can actually rewire your brain over long periods of time if you try hard enough. So that's, that's one really nice aspect of the brain, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, the brain is one of the most beautiful things there is, definitely. But I think that what's stopping people from pursuing their ikigai is this term that you touch upon that's the focusing illusion that they might be focusing on what society thinks is the ikigai or is the success or is the happiness instead of doing what actually would lead them to achieve true happiness. Yeah, so I, I think you are hitting the really important point there. Uh, 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 for the listeners, uh, this focusing illusion is um, a concept coming from the happiness research. You know, people think that something is uh, an absolute condition for achieving happiness. Like, for example, if a single person thinks that he or she should marry somebody in order to achieve happiness, um, that is actually an illusion because scientific studies suggest that no matter wh whether you are married or ma not, it doesn't make your happiness measure any different. And the same thing goes to money or social reputation, fame, you know, social status. All these things are illusions. I mean, your happiness doesn't depend on these things. So, but in order to understand that, you need some sophistication. I think you know. Even me, uh, you know, I'm 57 now, but uh, I used to be obsessed with things <laughs> myself. I, I, I should, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, but now I can say, uh, uh, based on my long uh, experience of research and uh, doing this and that, I can say that every, almost everything is an illusion. Um, you know, in Japan, I happen to be a bit famous, you know, because. I appear on TV and so on, but you know, so when I was a kid, uh, I thought that oh, people who are on TV are different people. I mean, they are living in some different universe or something like that. But you know, but now that I know the inside world of TV, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I haven't won the Nobel Prize yet, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I, I know many people who have done that, and uh, you know. When I was a kid, I thought no, winning a Nobel Prize, wow, that, that is fantastic, you know. Uh, you would be thrown into an entirely different universe. But I know, but now I know, it, it is just an illusion created by the Swedish Academy. It, it, it's nothing else, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so as I said, uh, I, I think you should really believe uh, what you really love. As I said, um, uh, I really love uh, Velasquez paintings. Uh, this famous painting, uh, La, I'm really bad at names. Uh, the, the princess and the mirror and the painter is there. What was the name of the painting? painting? No, I, I have know? no idea. I have no idea. But you know the painting, right? The, I think so, yeah. The most famous painting of Velasquez. Or, um, uh, you know, I, I, in Madrid, uh, you know, in the Prada, not Prada. Um, yeah, uh, there's this painting by uh, Bosch, Hieronymus Bosch, mm -hmm. uh, Garden of Pleasures. You know that one? I mean, I think so. It's a trip, you know, triple 
painting with fantastic figures. And when I go to Madrid, I really have to watch this painting. So, you know, I, I don't think Bosch, when he was alive, imagined that he would enjoy this fame and, you know, reputation when he was gone. And 500 years later, I would be admiring his painting in Madrid. But, you know, so these things do not matter. I mean, fame or reputation. What really matters is your love for something. You know, that's the only reality, I think, in the world. So I think many people are mistaken about that. I, 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 I can tell you are not so mistaken, right? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, I, I would you're like to think part. I'm not. What, what I personally think is that people shouldn't strive or yes, they should strive, but they shouldn't focus on the end goal or the achievement or the accolade. They should enjoy the journey. And if they enjoy the journey, then accolades, achievements, money, that's all a, that's just a result of you enjoying your journey. That shouldn't be your end goal. So yeah. that's what I think. Yeah, yes, yeah, put on there, I think. And uh, it can tell. I mean, uh, if you are really enjoying your journey, I think it it tells on the product. I mean, if a painter really enjoys painting, it shows on the piece. Uh, so I, I think we can actually tell whether somebody is really enjoying what he or she is doing. I, I completely yeah. agree. And I feel that people that are doing what they enjoy, you can tell and therefore by them doing what they enjoy, then they would later later on in life be able to achieve these accolades, be able to have money, be able to have what other people that are only striving to have. Oh, I want to be a millionaire. But if you don't think, oh, I want to be a millionaire, but I want to create this company, I want to do this startup because I enjoy it. Maybe later on in life, you do go on and become a millionaire. And then you're going to be humble enough. You're not going to have that ego because that wasn't your goal in the first place. Yeah, uh, you know, I, well, one, I, I had a really beautiful uh, story about Steve Jobs. Uh, you know, he came to Japan many, many times when he was young. He, when he was not so famous, he was, he was not so rich. But, you know, <laughs> um, he actually, I, I was really surprised to know that Steve Jobs actually was really fond of a certain uh, painting from a uh, really, you know, specific period of Japanese history. And nobody cares about it. I mean, you know, typically, I mean, for example, uh, many people know Hokusai, the Great Waves and Mount Fuji. Mm -hmm. This is a very famous painting. But uh, Steve Jobs was not you know, paid buying these things. I mean, Steve Jobs was buying something really, really, you know, uniquely specific when he came to Tokyo. And he was pursuing this uh, collection all his life, I learned. So, and the reason why he learned to love these paintings was when he was young, very young, uh, there was a neighbor. And when he went to the neighbor's house, there were these paintings and he fell in love with these paintings. And that's why Steve Jobs, you know, whenever he came to Tokyo, bought these paintings. And, so I think that kind of episode shows that, one, Steve Jobs really cared about what he loved. Two, he was not so much concerned about, you know, worldly reputations or market values or, you know, all these things. Prestige. So, yeah, prestige. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that tells you a lot about this man, Steve Jobs. He started from love and, you know, and he was really successful. So <laughs> I, I think you had a really uh, correct uh, model there. And, you know, people who start from love might succeed in the end. Definitely. I feel yeah. like they're more likely to. Yeah. And I would also love to expand on this Japanese concept of God in the 8 million gods. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and how that has allowed you guys to better enjoy the small things in life. So how can people that believe in the West, Western conception of God 
take this learning from the Japanese and start to appreciate the smaller things in life. Yeah, well, I think probably this is the most difficult part. I think it was uh, in Europe traditionally, of course, there is one God. And, you know, uh, nowadays many people are atheists, but, you know, for me, uh, that actually sounds like uh, the, the other side of the same coin. I mean, you know, I mean, people like Richard Dawkins, I mean, he, he, he says he's rational and he says there's no God. He wrote The God Delusion, a uh, wonderful book. And he's a great scientist. But at the same time, the way he talks about these things, whether you know there is a God or no God, or is too, you know, too much ideology for me. I mean, the Japanese approach to the gods, I mean, we we we, we traditionally believe eight million gods uh, uh, in the universe, and eight million actually stands for infinity. Uh, the Japanese approach is more naturalistic. I mean, it starts from what you are actually feeling. For example, when you are seeing a really beautiful natural scene, um, you are filled with awe. When you hear a beautiful piece of music, you wonder where does this come from? And you know, when you meet with a really wonderful person and fall in love, you are moved by this emotion and you know it almost overtakes you. So the Japanese approach starts from these individual feelings rather than a whole encompassing uh, ideology or worldview or belt on or whatever. I mean, so I, I think for European people traditionally, you know, living in the, you know, one God uh, universe, I think it will be, it'll be nice to start from, you know, immersing yourself in the here and now and starting from your yeah, specific emotions um yeah I, I that way i think you can probably you know start appreciating alternative ways of life and i i, I think you you I, I think you have that feeling too i mean definitely i feel that awe that feeling of awe is god or the the gods speaking yeah you you do feel that right yeah. Yeah. So I think we can start from there. You know, so as I wrote in the book, uh, Japanese people, you know, go to Shinto shrine, uh, do their funeral in Buddhist ways, and many people are getting married in Christian style. So that mm -hmm. sounds a bit crazy. Uh, I know, but, you know, but I think that's the Japanese way of embracing all these different emotions. Uh, that have been appreciated in society. So I don't know. Um, as a Japanese, I always thought, yeah, yeah, my my parents were Buddhist, but we go to Shinto shrine and we do celebrate Christmas. But <laughs> we don't. I I I don't think uh, as a kid uh, that was crazy or something. Mm -hmm. You know, not correct. I I feel like a more open-minded uh, way of approaching religion. Yeah, uh, I I don't know what what is happening in Europe. I mean, you know, and I hope it can, you know, you you, you, know, you know, this crash of different ideas. I think that's not really nice, isn't it? I mean, so I hope people can live harmoniously together. And um, I think uh, that the Japanese way might appear to be frivolous, but I think it it has some possibilities to you know. Definitely. Peace. Yeah. Definitely. And I would love to end with having a little recap of uh, the five pillars and yeah. maybe a little tip of how people can implement it or how people can think about their way of life. Yeah. Uh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> five pillars of Ikea. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they are starting small, uh, you know, joy of little things and releasing yourself and being in the here and now, and I thought, you know, something. job little things, releasing oneself, uh, yeah. being in the here and now, jobs and uh, uh, harmony and sustainability, wasn't it? 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. These, you know, these are all related to life, actually. I mean, so uh, I should say, you know, Japan is a great country for the philosophy of life. I, I, I think, you know, that is something we are better at. You know, the Japanese, Japanese culture did not produce Newtonian dynamics, for example, because, you know, uh, it very much related to the idea of one God creating the universe and natural laws and so on. We didn't create that, but we do have this wonderful philosophy of life. And for example, uh, Kintsugi, uh, you know, nowadays people know about Kintsugi. It's uh, when a wear breaks, you don't throw them away. You put them together again using gold. King refers to gold and Tsugi means you, you know, put them together. So you don't, when a wear is broken, you don't throw it away. And this is a great, uh, a philosophy of life for me because you know life can be imperfect you know life can be cracked um if you amend it it can be even better so there's a famous ball made out of 53 fragments from different balls and it's very highly regarded and I think that kind of thing is behind the five pillars of Ikigai. You know, it's a philosophy of life, a realistic philosophy of life. It's not a top-down, you know, Ten Commandments type philosophy of life. And so, and one other thing is, you know, if you are familiar with Japanese literature, you know, for example, Tale of Genji is uh, one of the oldest novels. And in it, um, the wife of the emperor has an affair with one of the princes, uh, Prince Genji. And, you know, and it's not written as something that would break the law or moral cause of, at the time. It's just humans doing, you know, things. And so there was always this sensitivity of naturalistic approach to what life involves which I think is very Japanese, I think. And it's different from the Chinese approach or the Korean approach even. I mean, I mean tra Japan traditionally has had all these, you know, natural acceptance of what can happen in life in its various phases. And I feel like, as you said, it's more realistic. Yeah. And it, is there anything else that you would like to say or anything specific that you would like to promote? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, really. I mean, um, you know, um, as I said, uh, I think, you know, uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, uh, in, in some of your earlier podcasts, you discussed this pandemic mm -hmm. of great length. And, you know, many people are saying that this would be probably a really great opportunity to revise our ideas about globalization. And so people are more self-focused and more locally, you know, connected and so on. So I think that this is a great time to, you know, rethink about our own Ikigai. Because, you know, um, I don't know about Spain, but, you know, in Japan too, we had these people who say, you, know, you cannot live a meaningful life unless you are flying all over the world on jet planes and speaking many <laughs> languages and you know this kind of people uh -huh. yeah but uh, they are gone now i mean because <laughs> you cannot travel anywhere do you have that kind of people in spain of course of course it's, you have those, those kind of people everywhere so what are they doing i mean they cannot go anywhere you know <laughs> So I, I think Ikigai to the rescue. I mean, you know, ik, because you can find your Ikigai even at such a difficult time. That's a, that's a great, uh, you know, merit of Ikigai, I think. Yeah, very democratic. We could find it in a hard times. And I personally, correct me if I'm wrong, think of Ikigai as life's purpose. Well, what's your life's purpose? Yeah, 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 that's right. And by doing this, you can reap all the benefits that we talked about and live a fulfilling life. Yeah. That's a one beautiful beauty of it. And as you said uh, at the beginning, uh, based on your personality, uh, you can fine tune your Ikigai style. So 
I, I you know, uh, so you can start your days slowly or in jumps and bumps, like myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Definitely has to be personalized to the person. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for watching this episode of the Rebound Talks podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. We're coming out with episodes every single Wednesday. So please subscribe, leave a like. And if you found anything useful, comment it down below. See you next week.